Gina, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm just going to get my screen share going here so you can see my slides for this evening. Everyone can see my first slide of the presentation. All OK, I think so. Great. OK, so uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I, I don't have anything else to add other than, yeah, I'm working with both uh, organizations in the Windsor Essex region. The Detroit River Canadian Cleanup I'll touch on in the presentation with a little bit more background, uh, but really primarily our focus is on the Canadian Detroit River and the Remedial Action Plan. And then with my role at the Essex Region Conservation Authority, uh, we focus on habitat restoration, stewardship, outreach, um, a, a lot of different programs across the entire region, and we have about 36 different watersheds that we uh, steward. And um, work with the public and different uh, partners to restore those watersheds and do programs um, to raise awareness and uh, improve water quality. So I'm going to get started. And I think uh, Jerry mentioned this too. If you have questions, please fill, put them in the chat. And then um, if they're uh, important for the position that I'm in in the slides, we can stop and then I'll try to answer them. And if I can't answer something today, I will write down your question and follow up uh, by tomorrow if I can with the answer. Um, I do work on a, the specific program for the Detroit River. And if your question sort of outside my understanding, um, I may not be able to answer it today, but I can find the answer for you um, within you know, a couple of days. So just wanted to let you know. So without further ado, I will get started. There we go. So, and remember, I'm going to be mostly talking about the Canadian side of the Detroit River, but um, some of the things go back and forth from a binational perspective, and I'll mention that when the time comes in the presentation. So when Indigenous people lived here, uh, the Tr Detroit River was an abundant source of fish, wildlife, beautiful coastal wetlands, and unspoiled drinking water. Uh, looking at it today, it is really hard to imagine what it might have looked like 300 years ago when there was over a kilometer of wetlands on either side of the river. And if you're familiar with the island system in the Detroit River, this is Pesh Island, which is one of the uh, top river, upriver um, Canadian islands. It's close to Belle Isle and the city of Windsor is the owner of Pesh Island. But of course, as we know with our human history with the Detroit River, uh, the, the river became notoriously polluted. And of course, um, we know that this has been going on for, for decades and decades, and our relationship with the water over time as we continue to evolve our understanding of environmental science and human health has changed in the way that we look at the water and its resource um, it's, it, as a natural resource for us on both the Canadian and the American side. So this is a picture that I recently found from our archives from the city of Windsor Vault. This is around 1980. Uh, this is at Brock Street in Sandwich, which is a community on the west in the west end of Windsor. And uh, the sign on the lifeguard's um, chair says, warning, high pollution readings are often found in these waters. Bathe at your own risk. So regardless of high pollution readings, people are still using the river as a recreational source. Um, and this is, you know, this has been part of our human history with the river. And um, we continue to experience impacts from, from pollution, making it sometimes unsafe for recreational use. And of course, our history continues with the river system. And from about 1874 to 1968, major construction projects created 96.5 kilometers, excuse me, or 60 miles of shipping channels. Uh, removing over 46 million 200,000 meters cubed of material. That's not just rocks, even though that's what the purpose of the extraction uh, really was about back then. It's habitat that fish need for spawning and other animals um, in the river system. And at the same time this was occurring, docks and other shoreline structures were being constructed out of sheet steel all the way down the shorelines. And we know that sheet steel doesn't have any habitat value for fish or uh, amphibians. And of course, uh, much of the land around the Detroit River is urbanized, and in some places heavily industrialized, and we're all familiar with that, that sort of landscape on the Detroit River system. 
And this has resulted in excessive pollution from the unregulated dumping of chemicals and industrial waste for many decades. And much of the garbage and sewage from, the Det from Detroit's rapid industrialization you know, found its way into the river. And as population grew, technology advanced, so did problems with drinking water quality and habitat loss and population loss of fish and wildlife. It took a while for people to realize that poor treatment of water was to blame, and drinking water treatment was not implemented until about 1916. Primary sewage treatment, where solids are just screened and removed and water disinfected, was not really practiced until about 1940 in our area. And of course, um, over time, these environmental issues became more and more apparent. People were noticing they're looking at the at the natural resource um, dwindle in the Detroit River system. The pollutants were so high after one spring uh, that uh, thousands and thousands of migrating birds were killed by oil slicks and contaminated water. Oxygen levels in the river were depleted to the point where fish were unable to inhabit the waters and dead ducks were collected from the Detroit River downstream of Detroit in the 1940s and 50s by sportsmen and laid at the steps of the state capitol in Lansing to demand action. And the Cuyahoga River caught fire several times in the late 1950s and 60s. And we know that now we know some forms of pollution are invisible just as much as some are completely visible to the human eye. Uh, but they both have long lasting consequences like legacy pollutants. And in the 60s and 70s, the people in this area and the media were reporting that Lake Erie was dying just down river of the Detroit River. There were huge mats of thick algae. Fish were washing up on shore in masses. The lake was, was not dying, but it was in fact very sick. And algae in smaller amounts is an important uh, food source for bugs and fish, but when it grows too quickly, it uses up a lot of oxygen in the water, which then kills fish. And it also can harbor bacteria that produces a toxin that can be harmful to humans and wildlife. It really wasn't until the public outcry over the algae blooms problem in Lake Erie that politicians took notice and decided to make a change. And if you're familiar with Dr. Seuss's story, The Lorax, um, he had written a line in his story about Lake Erie. And um, over time, as I'll, I'll talk about the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, but over time, um, a bunch of the uh, state senators or governors for the um, uh, for the Great Lakes area reached out to Dr. Seuss and said, please take that line out of your book. Uh, we've made a difference at this point. So interestingly, if you see recent publications of the Lorax, you won't see the line about Lake Erie, but older ones, you will. Um, just a, just a, thought that would be interesting for everyone to know. And so, of course, in, in compounding of all of these concerns and visual concerns and uh, loss of fish and wildlife habitat and populations, several important policies came into play soon thereafter. The U.S. Clean Water Act was amended to prevent water pollution and the Canada-U.S. Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was signed by Richard Nixon and Pierre Trudeau, mostly in response to phosphorus enrichment and the obvious burning rivers that were becoming uh, common to see. And in 1972, this agreement was first signed, amended in 1978, and also updated again in 1987 to include areas of concern to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the waters of the Great Lakes Basin ecosystem. And of course, I just mentioned the area of concern. And so this is um, a, a, a part of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement where they've identified areas of concern in 1987, um, areas that were more dire straits than other areas in the Great Lakes system. And the hope is to uh, remove an area of concern off the list or delist it, but it's not to preserve it or to take it back into its pristine environment. The analogy that we use in the area of concern program is really that we wanna remove the Detroit River out of the emergency room that it's in and just get it back to the same state as the Great Lakes. So maybe it's in the ICU right now and we just want it back in the waiting room so that other, um, and again, areas of concern are because of the legacy pollution and the industrialization of the area, 
Areas of concern have legacy cleanup programs to focus on remediation. We're not looking at invasive species or climate change, some of the more recent current environmental challenges that the Great Lakes are facing. The area of concern program does not address those because we're cleaning up the past. We're cleaning up you know, 200 years of stuff that happened to the river not what's currently happening to the river. There are other agencies and programs that are addressing those issues, but not the area of concern program that uh, I'm working on. So what does this mean? Um, and we know that uh, in order to address all of, the, all of these issues, we need to research and monitor and understand the system that we're trying to improve. So over time, the first report that was written about the Detroit River area of concern was in 1991, and it was called the Stage 1 Report. Basically a baseline of where are we at? What's wrong? What studies have do we have available? What do we need to further understand what's going on? Stage 2 was written and published in 2010, which kind of gave a, a State of the Union again but with some more uh, specific recommendations on how to improve, how to get to the goals of cleanup and remedi remediation. And stage three in delisting is the future. So we're not there yet, but we are working towards, again, removing the Detroit River from the list of areas of concern or delisting it. And remember also, we're only addressing the Canadian side. There are other agencies and groups like the Friends of the Detroit River PAC and the Friends of Detroit River who are addressing the um, American Remedial Action Plan for the Detroit River. In the 90s, when we were looking at the stage one report, um, both countries were working together to kind of write one report for the whole river binationally, but it was found that the environmental issues are different from in various degrees on both sides. And it was agreed that we should probably just worry about cleaning up our own side of the river um, in terms of a report and a, our, our, our plan of action. And of course, this work is too complex for any one agency to be solely responsible for cleaning up the Detroit River, restoring it and delisting it from the area of concern. So the DRCC or the Detroit River Canadian Cleanup is a partnership of many different organizations that all work together on the same goal of restoring and protecting the Detroit River. And we all wanna see it delisted from the list of um, areas of concern. And so the DRCC works with um, federal, uh, provincial, municipal governments. We work with local organizations, industries that are on the river, um, a lot of different groups that have interest in the, in the river system and the river health. And the way that we do that is through a governance system that we established during the stage two uh, process, where we have a steering and implementation committee at the very top, and that consists of our senior managers from Environment Can and Climate Change Canada, the Ministry of Environment, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources, um, different industry groups that are uh, you know associated with the river, and representation from the city of Windsor, the town of LaSalle, and the town of Amherstburg. And then underneath the steering committee, we have the RAP co coordinator, the remedial action plan coordinator, and myself, uh, who basically are the DRCC organization. We work with the partnerships, we do the meeting records, we set agendas, we help coordinate uh, meeting or work plans, we do outreach, we do all the different projects and coordinate all the partnerships. And then the way that we establish and um, go through our remedial action plan is by uh, working with different um, groups that represent specific aspects of the remedial action plan. So we have a monitoring and research work group. We have a habitat work group. We have a point and non-point source pollution work group. And then we have an education and public involvement uh, work group. And then our public advisory council is a group of dedicated citizens who are kind of like the watchdog. Is the DRCC uh, achieving what the remedial action plan says? So they, they attend our meetings, they comment on the science reports, they advocate for the river, and they're a great group of people. And if you've ever met any of them on the Canadian side, uh, they are just, they love the Detroit River and they wanna see it um, restored and, and improved and removed off the Great Lakes uh, water quality agreement list as well. We also, like I mentioned, we also work with the uh, US in 
a lot of different ways. Uh, we have what we call the Four Agency Management Committee, which consists of our Environment Canada and Provincial Senior Management for the Detroit River, but then also um, the US EPA and is it Michigan Eagle? That's your state environment um, ministry, but state, uh, we call them Eagle, Michigan Eagle. Um, but anyway, senior managers on both of those levels uh, sort of go through and make sure that we're uh, achieving remedial action plan goals and our work plans. We work with public advisory councils, uh, research collab collaboration with different um, universities to collect data, monitoring and research. Um, and of course, by national events like this and celebrations and opportunities where we can learn from all the different interest groups for the Detroit River on both sides of the border. And so pretty much if it makes sense for the DRCC, we'll be there in some capacity and support other groups who are, um, you know, advocating for the river and want to see it uh, returned in good health. <clears throat> so this is a big question. I'm going to go through this and I'm going to keep going through this information through the rest of our slideshow. So by by no means uh, do I need you to remember all these things right now. Uh, I'm going to really go through what this what this means. Um, how do we know when the river is not an area of concern anymore? Is it like a magical finish line we all just arrive at and cut the ribbon? I mean, how do we know when the environment's up to a certain standard that, you know, we're all okay with? Um, and that's a really tough question and complex question to answer. What we do know is that the Detroit River offers many ecological, recreational, and economic beneficial water uses. So the good things that we see when we have a healthy water system, beneficial use, good. But when something interferes with the enjoyment or beneficial use of a water system, it's called a beneficial use impairment. And so that's the term that is used in the area of concern program, a beneficial use impairment, which basically means something is impairing humans, wildlife uh, from using the water, a BUI. I'm going to say BUI because beneficial use impairment is a mouthful. So if you hear me say BUI, that's what I'm referring to. And we use scientific studies and data to identify the status of each BUI um, and determine, you know, in the stage one and stage two, whether it was impaired or not impaired. And on occasion, sometimes there was insufficient data to just to make a status determination. So these beneficial uses were deemed to require further assessment or more monitoring and research uh, uh, studies. And so it's a standardized way of saying across all areas of concern in the Great Lakes Basin, these 14 BUIs need to be addressed. And the 14 include restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption, tainting of fish and wildlife flavor, degradation of fish and wildlife populations, fish tumors or other deformities, bird animal deformities or other reproductive problems, degradation of benthos, restrictions on dredging activities, eutrophication or undesirable algae, restrictions on drinking water consumption or taste and odor problems, beach closings, degradation of aesthetics, added cost to agriculture or industry, degradation of phytoplankton and zooplankton populations, and loss of fish and wildlife habitat. So each area of concern program uses these 14 indicators to identify how it's doing, how, how far it's come, and what still needs to be done. So to visualize that, I'm going to show you where we landed with the Detroit River in 2010. We evaluated the BUIs and did a lot of research to have a really good understanding of the issues that the river was facing. And in 2010, it was found that um, added cost to agriculture and industry, tainting of drinking water flavor, of, of, sorry, of drinking water and undesirable algae were the only BUIs that were not impaired. So that meant 11 still either were impaired or required further assessment in 2010. So that's a lot of issues that the Detroit River was under, was facing still in 2010. And I'm going to show you how we've addressed these and how far we've come since 2010 um, when we wrote that stage two report. 
So I'll take you through a bunch of our projects that we've undertaken to make these improvements. And you will see the, the scale has tipped. We have made progress. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of how we've done that. Okay, so Windsor Riverfront Retention Treatment Basin. This is an underground project. You cannot see it just by walking on our riverfront. Um, but upgrades have been taken place, have been ta have taken place to the three wastewater treatment facilities along the Detroit River. Um, and the ongoing replacement, and this is always construction season in the city of Windsor, but it's for good, good reason. Um, for replacing the over and under sewers and the installation of the retention treatment basin. And so the retention treatment basin basically in a storm event where all of our wastewater treatment um, capacity is full because of how much water is coming through from a storm event, typically that would just go into all the combined sewer overflows in the city of Windsor and then go untreated into the Detroit River. And so we know that that's not a great thing to continue doing in um, you know, our modern time with, with the knowledge that we do have about water quality and the importance of protecting the Detroit River. So the city of Windsor uh, and a few other uh, organizations like Environment Canada and the Ministry of Environment, through the funding program of the Area of Concern program, uh, installed a $60 million project called the Windsor Riverfront Ret Retention Treatment Basin. And this treatment basin basically acts as like a holding tank during a storm event. So all that water that would really go through the combined sewer overflows gets diverted to this holding tank. It gets a little bit of primary treatment and then it sits there. And then when the storm system is done and the capacity is available again to our wastewater treatment plants, that water gets taken back to the wastewater treatment plants for further treatment. And so it's not going into the river untreated. And it can handle about 200 Olympic sized swimming pools of water per year. So win for the Detroit River. Another project that we did uh, focused on sediment remediation. And so um, majority of the contaminated sediments in the Detroit River are unfortunately on the US side. And on the Canadian side, we've undertaken one major sediment cleanup along Turkey Creek and Grand Maris Drain, where we removed 975 cubic cubic meters of PCB contaminated sediment and was disposed of safely. And follow-up monitoring has taken place, including monitoring for fish that use the drain system, the Grand Maris drain system, uh, to ensure that there is no further contamination use. And this project was completed in 2008 and cost about $2.65 million. And again, post-monitoring shows, yeah, there's a PCB reduction in sediment, reduction in water as it co is coming through the drain, decreased bioavailability and accumulation into young of the year fish, and the metals uh, contamination rates have improved over time at the remedi remediated area. And of course, as part of our monitoring program, uh, we do monitor wildlife for effects of these legacy, legacy contaminants, um, basically testing to see uh, effects of bioaccumulation. And so currently we're undertaking monitoring of turtles and tree swallows along the river. Tree swallows feed on insects that emerge from the bottom of the river where they may ex be exposed to toxic chemicals that are in the sediment. And when the birds eat the insects, they can accumulate these toxins. And Environment Can and Climate Change Canada researchers put up about 25 uh, nesting boxes along the Detroit River at four locations and have been monitoring them two to three times per week for the last few years during nesting season. And data is collected uh, looking at reproductive success, so clutch size, hatching success, fledging success, weight at fledging, and contaminants in the eggs. And they're looking at PCBs, mercury, and pro, <laughs> excuse me, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs. And so together, these projects will help us assess the bird or animal deformities or other reproductive, reproductive problems, BUI. And so at this time, our researchers have collected enough data to um, begin writing an assessment. And so the DRCC is expecting that assessment either this year or early spring next year to help us make an under have a better understanding of whether or not this BUI may not be impaired anymore due to improvements in the, in the Detroit River. 
And of course, uh, very exciting, we've undertaken quite a few different habitat projects to restore the shoreline. We've removed a lot of sheet steel wall, replaced it with rock and vegetation, which, which provides much more habitat value for many animals. And so some of the projects that we've undertaken, again, uh, 14 shoreline projects plus assessments of shoreline conditions along the whole river channel on the Canadian side. We've also undertaken a lot of tree planting, wetland and prairie restoration projects in the um, upper tributaries of the sub watersheds of the Detroit River. So that includes Little River System, Turkey Creek sub watershed and the River Canard watershed. And of course, one of our larger projects include uh, a sturgeon reef construction and expansion um, project at Fighting Island. And so, Again, going back to the impact of uh, construction of shipping channels, um, we know that one of the impacts was removing spawning habitat for many species and different fish need different size rocks to spawn in and in around. And when this rock was removed, they had nothing. And so that was a huge devastating blow to a lot of the local uh, populations of lake sturgeon whitefish in particular, who basically were extirpated from the Detroit River for over hundred years um, due to the shipping channel construction. And also between habitat loss and over harvesting by our early Europeans and settlers, um, the sturgeon suffered a major blow. And we know that this beautiful animal is um, a prehistoric river giant because they have bony plates and instead of scales, um, they can grow up to seven feet long and you know up to 300 pounds. And they're, they're in the river. They're just swimming around in the river because of the environment that the river provides. It's a perfect uh, deep, deep channel, slow moving, um, sediment murky area for these for these animals to spawn and to start their their next generation. Um, at one time, there were reports that sturgeon were so numerous in the Detroit River that people could walk on the backs of them to get from one side of the river to the other, which today we don't hear that at all. Um, but, you know, if you can imagine the the population in the river at the time but because of their large size early europeans used to get frustrated when they'd rip through their fishing nets and they were actually considered a pest species and so they were caught and burned in piles along the shore and then they discovered their value for meat and caviar and were over harvested and shipped back to europe and currently about 1% uh, of the historical population of lake sturgeon remains in the entire Great Lakes system. And this is one of the major habitat projects we undertook with our partners to help restore the population. And so you can see here, um, Turkey, Turkey Creek Outlet is kind of where the town of LaSalle is. And then this large island here is Fighting Island on the Canadian side of the Detroit River. I believe Gross Eel is just a little bit further downriver if you kind of know the, the order of the islands in the river system. And on Fighting Island, uh, near Fighting Island, we did construct a uh, deep water habitat uh, reef for the lake sturgeon. And to our um, you know, surprise, within the first year, the project was a success. And so the way that our, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Services um, kind of supported the, um, the jumpstart of the, the sturgeon, once the reef was put in, they placed egg mats on the reef and you can see that there, um, there have been, there, there are eggs that are deposited there as well. And there are not only sturgeon spawning on the reef, but other species like Lake Whitefish are spawning there too. And, um, it's a it's an incredible research story, and so every uh, every year, our uh, partners with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the Ministry of Natural Resources, and other groups uh, do a population survey of the lake sturgeon for both the U.S. and the uh, Canadian side, and um, the the numbers are increasing. I think at this point there's over 750 adults now uh, in the Detroit River system. And mind you, sturgeon don't just stay in the Detroit River. They are tagged and some of the fish that have been tagged from the Detroit River end up in Lake Huron. Turn this Huron. audio Huron. off. Oh. oh, did you have a question? No, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I have no oh, shucks.
So in terms of additional habitat restoration, when I was mentioned uh, the upper tributaries in our, uh, sorry, in the upper watersheds of the Detroit River, we've also undertaken a total of 277 habitat restoration projects between 2000 and 2020. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, cut out the background noise from who may ever be uh, not silence. Everyone pretty much is on mute. Okay, I hope we've got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, tree plantings, of course, were uh, the most common project of our habitat uh, approaches in, in the, uh, the upper watersheds, where we did about 207 projects with 56 wetland restoration projects, 32 prairie restoration projects, and a total of 18 shoreline projects um, in, the, in the 20 years that we've been working on our habitat and 15 fish habitat projects. Um, and when we undertook a, ma a mapping exercise of the footprint of these projects, we found that we had um, restored 3.8 kilometers square of trees um, in the Detroit River watershed uh, on the Canadian side. And additionally, over 10,100 uh, meters of shoreline has been softened as part of habitat restoration projects that we're, we're counting as well. And <clears throat> just to help you visualize the shoreline uh, changes over time, uh, we've, been, we've been really measuring the progress we've made over the last 30 years. And the extent to which Detroit River shorelines were hardened does vary by municipality. But for the entire Canadian shoreline of the Detroit River, currently 39% of the shoreline was identified as hard um, and 61% is softened, but we're not really, uh, we're, we're, we still don't consider that entirely reversing the trend of hardening. There's still some opportunities on the Canadian side. If, um, landowners approached us or uh, industry partners on the river, if they wanted to soften their shoreline, uh, we would we would definitely support that in, in, um, in regards to our habitat restoration goals. Now, in terms of where we're at, again, in um, some of our projects, since the pandemic uh, began in 2020, the DRCC and partners um, successfully did redesignate re uh, three BUIs from not impaired or needs further assessment to, sorry, impaired or needs further assessment to not impaired. So now uh, fish tumors and other deformities, degradation of benthos and degradation of phytoplankton and zooplankton populations are no longer impaired for the Detroit River. And I'll take you through our science and monitoring to help uh, with that understanding. So in terms of fish tumors and other deformities, um, we know that fish deformities can be caused by pollution and sediment contamination. And in part, this is due to legislation introduced by both Canada and the US authorities to restrict the discharge of many contaminants into the river. And we know there's still contaminants present. They're not removed all 100% yet. Um, but the prevalence of tumors in brown bullhead, which was uh, our indicator species, excuse me, chosen for this assessment, are decreasing. And researchers from the Great Lakes Institute of Environmental Research, or GLIR, on the Canadian side examined liver tumors and brown bullhead caught in the Detroit River. And their results showed that liver tumors of uh, brown bullhead uh, have decreased to less than 1% or one of 112 fish, a rate that is lower than the actual rest of the Great Lakes background, which is 2%. Uh, these results indicate that liver tumors in the Detroit River are no more prevalent than the rest of the Great Lakes, and that's one of our goals. Uh, and so based on this, uh, we consider the fish tumors and other deformities beneficial use impairment no longer impaired for the Canadian side of the Detroit River. And in terms of our benthos, uh, benthos or uh, macro benthic invertebrates are a group of organisms made up of aquatic worms, insects, and other invertebrates which inhabit the bottom of lakes and rivers. And many benthos are a key source of food for fish, frogs, and other wildlife. They are a very important component of the food chain, of the food web. And studies of, uh, results of studies on the river show that sediment contaminations have declined steadily between 1999 and 2013. 
and that the vast majority of the Canadian side of the Detroit River showed minimal benthos impairment and potential for bioaccumulation. And so these re results indicate that the benthos communities are now uh, recovered to, the, to a point where they're no longer impaired in the Detroit River. And in terms of phytoplankton and zooplankton, uh, we know that these uh, plant and animal organism populations make up the base of the aquatic food web and are an important food source uh, for many wildlife in the Detroit River. And initially, there was insufficient data on the phytoplankton and zooplankton populations in the river, and that's why it had the needs further assessment um, designation. And so the, the DRCC and partners undertook additional studies and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, conducted a very comprehensive study in 2019. And their study results indicated that phytoplankton and zooplankton populations are naturally lower in the river due to expected river conditions. So fast moving water through the river channel, um, that they're not, it's not due to human activities. And so based on the research findings of all their studies, there is no more evidence of impairment to the plankton population, phyto and plankton, phyto and zooplankton populations in the Detroit River. And that uh, impaired status resulted in uh, not impaired as well. And so remember when I said this was our um, state of our beneficial use impairments in 2010. So some of the work that I kind of took you through, and we have lots of other projects as well, but um, for the interest of time, I only wanted to highlight some of the really uh, major ones. This is where we're sitting today in terms of our beneficial use impairment status changes. So you can see we have tipped the scales of progress um, in the Detroit River system, but you know what? Where we're at right now, we are sitting with the last four of the hardest and most challenging complex beneficial use impairments to deal with and to, to figure out and to identify the impairments of fish and wildlife populations, habitat loss, restrictions of fish consumption, and, and um, reproductive uh, challenges in wildlife. And so th those are the last four beneficial use impairments that we are addressing and uh, undertaking and continuing to undertake more science and research monitoring to understand them better. And so we realistically don't expect that the Detroit River on the Canadian side will be delisted probably for another five years. It depends. Um, it depends on how our studies go. It depends on the results of our studies and it depends on our work plan. So at this time, as I sit here talking to everyone today, I don't know when the Detroit River will be delisted from the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement list um, at this time. So this is an ongoing thing that we're, we're dealing with every single day um, in our program. <clears throat> so how do we plan on addressing the last of these beneficial uses. What kind of studies do we have coming up? What are we doing? How, where are we going from here? And so, like I said, the last four are the toughest ones. They're very challenging. They're very complex. And so one of the things that we're, we have undertaken is really getting an understanding of what fish are people even eating from the river? Um, and so we undertook a, a fish consumption survey uh, where we were hoping to gain a better understanding yeah, of what, what fish people are eating, how much they're eating, are, who are they feeding, and uh, how often are these eating, how often are they eating fish. In addition to this survey, I'll show you the assessment is sort of uh, almost complete, but these were the top 10 most consumed fish in the Detroit River on the Canadian side, according to our survey. And I think the results probably aren't surprising. Walleye, yellow perch, white bass, small and large mouth, mouth bass, silver bass, crappy, rock bass, northern pike, channel catfish, and brown bullhead. And in addition to understanding fish consumption restrictions, we have also focused on um, a lot of monitoring and research uh, with our partners at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research and the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, where our researchers have undertaken statistical assessments of tissue residues in sport fish, focusing on PCBs and mercury as the primary pollutants to understand um, what those levels are and how, how, um, how, how many of the fish that they're sampling are um, do have, have those pollutants inside of their bodies. 
They've also undertaken food web and fish movement models to understand what species are moving across the, the river channel and where they're, um, whether they're a resident fish or they're a through fair fish and just understanding behavior of fish in the Detroit River um, through the University of Michigan and our Great Lakes Environment um, Program at the university. Uh, they've undertaken studies uh, looking at mercury isotopes in sediment and fish. And of course, um, current research where we're sitting kind of shows that further remediation on the Canadian side wouldn't really improve consumption advisories for our indicator fish, which are walleye, brown bullhead, and smallmouth bass. And so this is ongoing. Uh, we don't expect the fish consumption BUI to be re re designated as not impaired for another few years. This one is a very complicated one and the research is still ongoing. So more to come on, on this uh, issue in the river. Um, in terms of continuing addressing our fish populations and habitat, we know that by creating fish habitat um, in the Detroit River really contributes to healthy and productive fisheries. And so this, <clears throat> This is a picture of Pesh Island. You can see that on the um, Canadian side here uh, to the top right of the photo, you can kind of see the, some gravel. Uh, that is where, that's like, um, I'm just trying to think, Sandpoint Beach. If you're familiar with the Sandpoint Beach location in Windsor, that's right there. And then of course we have all of uh, Lake St. Clair coming in. So this is really the head of the Detroit River. And in terms of our Pesh Island project, some of you may have heard that we've undertaken a very large uh, restoration uh, project on Pesh, at Pesh Island. And so over time, uh, we know that there was an estimated decrease in area, approximately 17 acres lost from erosion uh, from 1931 to 2017. And you can kind of see in these two aerial photos here how much the island shape and available land has changed due to erosion. And a lot of that erosion is from the freighters coming in and that high wave velocity and energy hitting the island over and over and over again. And of course that erodes the island resor natural resources that erodes the shoreline and it erodes the opportunity for calmer backwaters for nursery habitat for fish and cooler shallower waters for submerged aquatic vegetation. And so a few years ago, the city of Windsor was looking at options to reduce this erosion and approached us and we started to come up with um, a really large scale habitat restoration project to pr protect the island. And so over time, uh, we began to develop these nine sheltering islands in the Detroit River where rocks were dropped. And you can kind of see, this is an engineering drawing, but you can kind of see those sheltering islands across the um, northwest area of the Pesh of Pesh Island to protect that uh, from the wave action, and those behind them into the island create that more shallow, uh, calmer backwater area. And uh, with the with the hope that we would create uh, a fish fish habitat for uh, a certain species at risk and other fish that would benefit from that type of um, habitat. And so, of course. When we did our post monitoring of the project, we found 20 new native fish species that were not previously recorded in past surveys were captured and 13 juvenile species were caught in their juvenile and adult life stages um, in this area. So I think that chalks up the project to very successful. And I'll show you another uh, picture of, I'm going backwards, sorry. Um, I'll show you this, this kind of is another uh, aerial view of those sheltering islands and how they kind of form along the, the northwest side of the island. <clears throat> and in terms of our post monitoring, we had to do a uh, quite extensive um, post monitoring of Pesh Island to um, report to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada on the success of our project. And so not only did we have to do biological, we also did physical monitoring as well where we looked at the macro fight coverage in the back row, oh, sorry, the backwater area. And of course the native fish species usage of that backwater area and what their life stages were in that backwater area. And then in terms of physical monitoring, uh, we looked at different engineering surveys of the wave action on those sheltering islands to determine um, if they in fact did prevent erosion and, um, and whatnot. So a very involved project. 
And like I mentioned, um, we did see in October to December in our terms of our fish salvage, a total of 1,134 fish were removed from the construction site and released approximately 500 meters downstream into similar habitat. And so we, we saw three mud puppy, 61 crayfish were also removed and released downstream. And I wanted to make a note, um, we did as expect uh, see round gobies, which are considered an invasive Great Lake species. They really did dominate the total catch, especially in the early stages of, of the collection. But uh, to top it off, the northern mad tom, which is an endangered species at risk in Ontario, we were able to catch 42 in our fish salvage, which is a huge indication of success for this because northern mad tom were not in the river system at all before we did this project. And then when we did our um, post monitoring, we saw 42 just in that area uh, using the space and the new habitat. And so um, other commonly collected species included shiners, young of the year rock bass and log perch, which is really exciting. And I'll show you a couple extra pro uh, photos. So these are aerial drone footage photos. So they're, it's kind of hard to see, but that's what the, the islands look like. Um, and it, of course, in this picture, there's only four, but in total we did nine. So we had to phase the project. Um, this was undertaken during the pandemic and you know things were expensive during the pandemic. The price of rock went up because of high water levels. People were restoring their shorelines, reinforcing their shorelines all over um, Southwestern Ontario. So we had to readjust our original budgets for this project because things were just way more expensive. Um, but we did end up putting nine uh, rock sheltering islands in. Um, and of course, here's some other photos here. This is on the water in the boat, so you can kind of see what the, the islands look like uh, against the, the side of the Pesh, of Pesh Island and looking downriver. We can see the Renaissance Center there. <clears throat> and then just some uh, photos of our post-construction monitoring where they had to go in, like I mentioned, and do some uh, monitoring of the uh, backwater area. And we do have a video on the City of Windsor's YouTube channel if you wanted to see uh, the restoration rock dropping <clears throat> in action, uh, feel free to go and take a look at that. It's just drone footage that um, is available to the public. And <clears throat> excuse me, one final project I want to mention is uh, a wetland project that we just restored at the mouth of the River Canard system which uh, 75 acre wetland restored. Uh, we kind of refurbished uh, the outside berm, in installed a pumping system and a management plan as well, where we also undertook uh, a prescribed burn this past spring and have done some invasive Phragmites management as well. And so those are two of the most recent projects, the Pesh Island and the Colavino wetland that we've uh, been undertaking. And really to wrap this up, <clears throat> I just wanted to leave with some inspiration about the Detroit River and some parting words. And, you know, we're here today because we all believe and know that the Detroit River is a special place. And as a person that works with the DRCC, we get to talk to many people within the watershed that know this and have known this for their whole lives. And they truly want to see the river restored. Um, <clears throat> The river is situated in the most biologically diverse region in Canada, and we know this because of the variety of plants and animals that call the river home. Part of our work is to protect them and restore their populations. And the Detroit River is a connecting waterway between two countries, and this allows us to learn from our American friends and our partners as they too work to restore the river. And then one of the points that we really try to drive home is that stewardship of our natural resources also recognizes responsibility. We know that protecting the, the river supports the fact that it's a drinking water source for 5 million people on both sides of the border. It's known around the world for its walleye fishery and taking, sorry, and protecting and um, enhancing habitat and environmental uh, quality ensures that fisheries here can continue on. And of course, on both sides, you see people walking down the river, um, using it as a recreational area for enjoyment, fishing, riding your bike, going for walks, looking at the water, boating, um, and of course, we can't really ignore the rich history that's surrounding the Detroit River as well. It's an incredible story of, of human history for both Canada and the US. 
And for that too, the Detroit River is recognized and designated as an American Heritage River and a Canadian Heritage River, the only river in both countries to have this dual designation. And so we know that the Detroit River is very special and you know, we wanna to continue to watch and, and, and monitor and to restore the river. We don't wanna see this go backwards. We don't wanna to see all that work uh, be undone. And so that was just, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit of our story with everyone here. So you kind of get an idea of what we're doing on the Canadian side and the work that we still have yet to do um, as we continue on this uh, journey. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Gina. Uh, we do You're have uh, a question in the chat, and then we can probably take um, some more questions from anybody. Uh, let me uh, read this one in the chat. Are there, is there any data that compares the differences between the issues and proposed remediation plans of conditions on the U.S. side versus the Canadian side? If so, please share a link. Yeah, that's a great question. So I believe um, the the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement um, through both the U.S. and Canada have a, a website called, I think it's binational.net. And you can see there the progress on both the Canadian and American side, and they break it down into environmental issue. And like I said, the great, the area of concern program is one annex of the, of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. There are, I think, 13 annexes. So if you went to binational.net, you can see the entire um, proposal of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and you can compare Canadian and American commitments and projects and um, progress on, on achieving uh, restoration and, and, and whatnot. Okay, um, I have a question too. Yep. So is the actual cleanup uh, and making the, the river more healthy dependent on taking dredging chemicals and contaminants out of the river, or how does it happen that things get better? That's a great question. So on the Canadian side, we did some studies to understand how contaminated our sediment was on the Canadian side and where that contaminated sediment is. And the one location that we determined was the one I mentioned in our presentation. On the Canadian side, in the channel itself, there are no more projects that we need to undertake to make improvements in sediment chemistry and bioaccumulation. However, outside of the river channel itself, in Lake St. Clair and the western basin of Lake Erie, there are sources of PCB and uh, mercury that are impacting transient fish that are still driving our fish consumption challenges in the Detroit River. So our Detroit River program knows and understands the outside system influences, but our program itself doesn't is not able to address that unless we advocate and influence that other programs also work together to make those changes. Now that's just for the Canadian side. On the American side, there if you look at their BUI status, it's different than ours because on the American side, I believe in the next three something years, there's going to be a lot of sediment contamination removal in the Detroit River Channel and um, in areas by islands and sort of by the shoreline. So that is going to make a huge difference on the American side. And then a lot of those improvements to the basis of the food web, so like phytoplankton and zooplankton, benthos, deformities, tumors, those issues will improve once the sources of those contaminated sediments are removed. Mm -hmm. um, how, how divorced are the two sides of the river as far as the health goes? So can you have a healthy Canadian side and an unhealthy, unhealthy US side? That's a great question. And that's one of the philosophy questions of our program that people ask all the time, because how can you say one side is, is great and the other one is not? And so it's it's largely policy, but also um, research and monitoring as well. On the Canadian side, say if we achieve all of our science and monitoring and restoration goals 
and our BUIs are no longer impaired, I cannot see us moving forward to say we've delisted only half of the river. I believe we will continue to want monitor the Detroit River to make sure that our progress is still going in the right direction and probably see a binational delisting celebration between Canada and the US. This has never been done before. I should also say there is no area of concern binationally that has done this yet. So this is all new still. We talk about it in our meetings and we talk about, well, does this make sense? What would the public say? How, how would we frame this? Um, and I do believe that I, I don't think they will do one side or the other without the other. I think it'll be a together celebration when we get to that spot. We may not get there at the same rate, but yeah, I don't think we'll just delist the Canadian side and sit there and wait till the American side is um, has has their BUIs redesignated as well. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Um, it's a binational area of concern. Other areas of concern are just w w not binational. So when they meet their their goals, they can delist. I think there's only been two areas of concern out of the 43 that have been able to remove themselves from, from the list, or three maybe, I think, now at this point, but not no binational ones. Okay. Uh, well, we still have a few minutes. Does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question, like not make a comment, hopefully more like ask a question? Anyone? Like I can stop that? sharing my, I'll stop sharing my screen too, so you can see everyone again. Would that okay, be helpful? Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. there you go. Okay, is anyone interested in asking a question? You can unmute. Okay. The question, uh, the question I had was already asked, and thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome, Sherry. I do want to say if you are curious and would like to um, stay informed of the American side of the Detroit River Area of Concern program, check out the Friends of Detroit River. They are like our sister organization. You know, we have the DRCC on the Canadian side and the Friends of the Detroit River are the American. Um, I'm not doing anything. No, they are. They 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 are. The, the amount of habitat restoration. I in the on the American side of the river has been fantastic. And you know what, maybe that would be a compliment, uh, compliment uh, tree presentation to mine is to maybe reach out to see if someone from the Friends of Detroit River could present as well. So you can have a, a good, you know, understanding of both the Canadian and the American side as just as a recommendation, or, uh, you know, to consider for another one of your meetings another time. Mm -hmm. um, I do have one more question. And that is that you would think that the sediment, how, how does, how do the toxins, do they go straight down into the water and um, get in this one spot? I mean, you'd think it would get, all get washed away, but how did, how did in the past, how did they actually get into the, into the soil in the bottom of the river? That's a really good question too. And so um, if you imagine in our industrialized past, where there were no environmental protection laws about discharge or any of the emissions that were going into the air, a lot of the sources of mercury in the Detroit River are from coal-fired power plants emitting that as a source into the atmosphere. And as it comes down in the atmosphere, it settles into the water channel, into the water column, and eventually it combines itself to sediment and then will, will settle in. And so, a lot of the legacy pollution is non-point source pollution where it is not obvious where it came from. And so we can see maybe, for example, Zug Island is a fixed location, but there's pockets of sediment contamination downstream, but you can't say it's from Zug Island because that's a non-point source pollution. Um, it could be from in industrial practices upstream and it just settled and eventually laid itself in the channel downstream from an industrial um, practice. And I should also say too, when our sediment committee did a lot of the um, investigations into sediment contamination, it's not uniform. So it's not like a perfect layer of mercury, a perfect layer of PCBs. It's like a lasagna all over the place. and 
it's um, it's an incredible what hap what is in the river system. Um, and if you do have the Friends of Detroit River uh, present, they can give you a really good understanding of that because they've played a major role in the sediment contamination um, studies and have a good understanding of the environmental engineering challenges that are, I mean, you'll be able to go to the riverfront and watch the tugboat soon enough. You'll see them out there trying to pull the stuff out of the river. Um, so it's, it's not a uniform deposition. The river channel comes around the corner and does a bend. Um, it's a fast moving river. We dredge the river. So I can't, you know, the way that it deposits is just based on, you know, the, the dynamics of the river itself and uh, the way the sediment rolls through. Mm -hmm. I see we have Sam Lovell on our um, watching today. And Sam was a um, presenter a few months ago and talked about Belle Isle. So oh, Sam. Uh, this gives us another another side of the story. There he is right there. <laughs> Sam, you got any Hi, uh, words of wisdom for everybody? Hi, Gina. And uh, wow, what a great presentation you just made. Thank you. Uh, it, was, it was fantastic. Um, in so many things that I could reiterate what you just said about uh, sediment deposition, basically uh, it's, you know, all the contaminants are along the, the U.S. side based on how the river flows. And, and it's, I mean, obviously uh, probably the U.S. side did a little more damage than the Canadian side during the last century, but everything that happened in the river came over to the U.S. side <clears throat> and is along our shoreline. So, you know, that's, that has complicated uh, the, the uh, benef beneficial use impairment re remediation process for um, the U.S. side. We're working at it a little bit um, differently than the Canadian side where, you know, you're doing all the, what seems to be the right things first. The biggest problem we have on, on the US side are the sediments. And it's a huge funding issue. Based on the um, water quality agreement, we got you know some great water in the Detroit River. So we, we, we were doing a lot of uh, habitat restoration, uh, you know, attacking these um, these uh, BUIs that have to do with with um, degradation of, of uh, habitat populations and those those kinds of things. And we're really on the edge of eliminating those BUIs, even though the huge problem that you guys have already pretty much taken care of because it's not so big on your side is yeah. the sediment issue. This is going to be billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars to remove uh, huge quantities of contaminated sediments. So those are, um, you know, I think they're, I think they're kind of uh, in the mill. Where you know, there is this Great Lake, Great Lakes Legacy Act that we're um, we're utilizing, but it does require match funding, thirty five percent. You know, it needs to be it needs to come from uh, private sources or non you know you know non grant funded sources. So this means industry's got to you know speak up. Uh, maybe our state legislature has to speak up. We have to find funding to match these federal dollars that we have that, that are in the mill, and they're gonna they're gonna sunset in the next four four to five years. So th it's an emergency now. To, to, to move forward on these sediments. People are working on it. I don't wanna say that it's a, a, a you know, a, a situation where it's not gonna happen, but there is definitely some, some activity to move forward to take care of these sediments on the US side. But that truly is, is the problem on the US side. The, big, the bigger issue is the sediments. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any other questions? Uh, Ed, would you like to add something or ask a question? Ed McArdle? You gotta unmute, uh, Ed.
Okay, I just uh, I'm just was wondering about uh, Gordy Halbridge, and if that has any effect on the wetlands on the Canadian side. That was an issue with us in the Canadian Sierra, Sierra Club at the time when it was proposed. Um, do you know anything about that, Gina? Uh, so are you familiar with the Ojibwe Prairie Complex on the Canadian side? A little it's, bit. Um, a little bit. It's a really fabulous uh, remnant of our, you know, natural heritage and our heritage past on the um, Windsor sort of west end. And it's a collection of um, properties that sort of make up this complex, but it's not one big parcel. It's uh, different uh, parcels that are sort of not fragmented, they're sort of connected, but they're, it's not like a, a nice polygon. It sort of looks like if you were to imagine like a necklace laid out with beads, it's like, you know, a little bit disoriented, but it's still a significant, um, very significant ecosystem. A lot of species at risk live in that uh, Ojibwe Prairie Complex, but not only that, um, it does include the Black Oak uh, Savannah ecosystem, which is an endangered ecosystem in Canada. And of course, the Gordie Howe footprint, and um, I guess you would call it the, the on-ramp, is right next door to a section of the Ojibwe Prairie. And so as you are entering the Gordie Howe Bridge, you will be driving by um, the entrance to the, the Black Oak uh, Heritage Park. And the way that the footprint of the bridge kind of curves around, it actually did not uh, take away any of the acreage of the Ojibwe Prairie Complex. It sort of landed in some, of course, Windsor's West End is sort of like a combination of residential, um, natural and industrial sort of uh, commercial settings. And so the Gordie Howe um, Bridge program when they were looking at properties made the footprint land sort of like in an um, already sort of uh, commercial industrial property. It didn't really encroach on any um, wetland or forest systems but one thing I and I'm not entirely sure and I don't want to speak wrong about this but there is the black oak drain system which is a fish habitat that they uh, provided some fish habitat enhancement because part of their stormwater management sort of connects to that area and they are right on the shoreline of the Detroit River and so the Gordie Howe uh, folks on the environmental team they have done some pretty nice um, habitat enhancement projects on the Canadian side, but they didn't really destroy anything. Um, so maybe your experience is a lot different on the American side, but we didn't have, we've, we've been invited to their um, stakeholder meetings where we got to question some of their um, environmental design uh, work and, and uh, environmental management systems for the bridge, but they didn't destroy habitat where the public was, um, you know, not okay with what what the decisions were so that that wasn't our experience on the canadian side okay. good to okay. know thank mm -hmm. you yeah uh jing jing do you have a question uh just briefly i i put it in the chat too i wonder if gina could elaborate a little bit on the phragmites um removal or remediation work that was done since that's something we face on our inland wetlands here yeah uh sure so um in so I guess I should preface this by saying, um, like I mentioned, the area of concern program is not um, looking at current environmental challenges, and one of them being invasive species. So our area of concern program doesn't um, include uh, focus in programs that remove invasive species like Phragmites from the Detroit River, um, whether it's the channel itself or any of the areas in the upper tribu tributaries. But what we're noticing is Phragmites is significantly changing our wetland systems in our upper tributary areas in our coastal wetlands, which is reducing our, excuse me, marsh bird breeding habitat and our marsh bird populations. And marsh birds are some of our indicator species uh, for our um, populations BUI. And so now it's of interest to kind of take a look at Phragmites as a barrier to improving populations. And so on the Canadian side, we have a little bit more conservative source water protection 
uh, legislation on the American side. So when um, herbicide applications are used in Phragmites uh, management projects, we cannot spray in open water areas. We're not, we're not allowed to do that. And so one of the ways that we've um, been able to approach Phragmites management is if it's in a wetland system, that we are able to manipulate the water levels. We can draw down all the water, deal with the Phragmites and cut it down, burn it, um, and then ideally drown it in the next growing season so that all of the fresh uh, vegetation and at the, the rhizome level won't pop up again. And then we find that when we're able to do that successfully, the uh, wetland vegetation that's already sort of in the native wetland vegetation, it's sort of in the seedbed already, and it just needs the conditions to, to thrive and it'll come back. We've um, seen other groups do hand removal of invasive phragmites. We've also seen people use um, herbicide applications in areas where um, there is no standing water, but it's kind of been coming in. And, um, you know, if your stand is if you can put your hands around it, you can kind of do hand wicking to remove it. But, it, you know, as you know, it grows in huge stands. And so at this point on the Canadian side, what all of the resource managers are saying is until we have um, a solution that all resource managers and landowners, municipalities, conservation authorities, mm -hmm. ministries, et cetera, can use, uh, we can't really, unless you have money, we can't really battle it because it's very expensive on, on our side to uh, to deal with. So it's an ongoing battle and it's very sad to see all of the Great Lakes um, areas and our our ditches and our, our, our wetlands and our shorelines kind of be overrun by Phragmites. Um, and if, you know, if we see cattails, we're happy. It's kind of rare to see cattails sometimes in our area now. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of um, our a very basic approach that we kind of take over here on the Canadian side. Okay, yeah, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, um, well, we are at 8.16 and um, Gina, thank you very much for the presentation today. And just as Sam said, it was excellent. And um, <laughs> so we got some few comments from everybody and um, thank you very much. Let's have a hand for Gina, yay! Everybody, give me a hand. Okay. Thank you. Yes, folks. Well, next uh, next month we'll have Todd Scott from. Um, uh, he's in charge of the bike lanes in Detroit. So we'll see what's up with that. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Bye. Bye.